Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to World... Oh my goodness, what game are we playing? We're playing... Oh, that's a hard open, I'm gonna have to keep that. Uh, we're Today we're playing War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition. Uh, it is our play by email game against XTRG, and we are now looking at the combat results for December 30th of 1941. Uh, so far, the war has gone kind of a mixed bag. Uh, the Japanese are having quite a bit of success on the Philippines and just took the city of Malaya. They're also having some pretty substantial success with their submarines and sinking numerous uh, warships here uh, and uh, cargo, well, more cargo ships. Um, and they're also appearing to begin the process of driving. I, we're suspecting they're driving on Fiji. Uh, but we're not 100% sure. We had some intelligence that suggested New Caledonia last turn, and in general, it seems like a drive uh, south to cut off Australia. The interesting thing, though, is that uh, that drive is precluding a serious effort uh, at uh, moving on the Dutch East Indies. The Japanese just barely uh, took the northern coast of Borneo, or portions of the northern coast of Borneo, but they haven't made a serious play on Singapore. There was a major battle fought around Mersing uh, on the southern Malay Peninsula, uh, but that's kind of turned into a stalemate or a quagmire at the moment, and the Japanese have not yet uh, made a drive south. They really haven't made any progress moving south along the uh, Philippine or, or along the Malay Peninsula. They've they had a little bit. I think they took Georgetown last turn or two, but that's still way up north, and they really haven't started driving south. So overall, we're almost into January without a serious threat or even a formulating threat to Singapore at this time, which is good for us because we're in the process of fortifying the area. Uh, we have had several ships that have been damaged by uh, Japanese ships in a battle off Mersing. Uh, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse were both damaged. Uh, in a series of actions which resulted in the Japanese losing a battleship of their own. And there you can see the Prince of Wales is in the process of trying to pull out to repair in South Africa. Meanwhile, the Japanese are now landing troops on Tulagi here, near uh, Guadalcanal. So the Japanese appear to, begin in, to be beginning their drive south from Tarawa. They've taken Tarawa, they've taken uh, Nehru Island, Ocean Island, but this is the first move in maybe a week or so that we've seen with them driving further south towards that Fiji line that we've been talking about. Uh, meanwhile, continued submarine actions off the coast of Australia. Looks like they may have sunk a large troop, or not troop transport, but a large cargo ship off the coast of Sydney. Uh, or if they didn't sink it then, they're going to sink it now with a follow-on attack by the S-11, or sorry, S or SSI-10. So the I-10 Japanese submarine uh, has now sunk the Marpeza. I don't think anything was on that cargo ship. I think it was just uh, kind of an empty ship, so that's good. Um, but that's currently what's going on here. The Japanese have landed uh, on uh, Tulagi, which we have no troops there, so they're going to take that, and are moving into the Solomon Islands uh, with uh, some gusto there. But again, all of these efforts have been with the Japanese carriers, presumably not in the Dutch East Indies, because we haven't seen them lately. The last time we saw the Japanese carriers, they were at the Kwajalein Atoll, and they were presumably replenishing their stores there uh, because that's one of the Japanese major bases in sort of the central Pacific and I'm assuming uh, they were planning for some operation in the Pacific. I mean we haven't seen them since. Uh, we had recon over Kwanjalin. That was the first time we saw them. They did uh, help bomb Midway which has fallen to the Japanese as well uh, and then they fell back on Kwanjalin and that was probably about a week ago now as well. Meanwhile this turn is off to somewhat of a slow start. We did have the one uh, cargo ship sunk. We did have the Japanese landing troops on uh, Tulagi. Uh, and now we have the Japanese bombing our troops at uh, Wuchao. And then we have Japanese uh, forces that are uh, attacking Georgetown. So I guess I was wrong. Georgetown has not fallen to the Japanese. I felt like it did, but maybe they just moved troops in there? I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I could have sworn that it fell last turn. Maybe it's about to fall. I don't know. I actually haven't watched this replay yet. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what kind of comes of it this turn. Lots of Japanese bombing actions in China and in the Asian uh, sort of Malay Peninsula area. But uh, not much else that we've seen so far other than the landing on Tulagi. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I think we're going to speed the replay up a bit here. 
uh, just to kind of get things moving a little bit so we're not spending quite so much time watching recon flights and unopposed bombing raids. We did have our um, fighter aircraft at Singapore take the day off. I think that's their second day off in a row to try and give them some time to rest and replenish their, uh, their losses and their air crews. The Japanese have not knocked out our air force there by any means. We have over 50 ready fighters there. So uh, I think the intent is to kind of give them a couple of days off. And the Japanese bomber forces attacking Singapore have lost over 100 bombers already. And so the, uh, you know, by holding our, our Air Force back, we're replenishing our strength. He needs to take some time to replenish his own strength as well, though. Um, so he's been doing just fighter sweeps with no bombing raids, which means Singapore's airfield is back to 100% which is very good for us. So let's go ahead and fast forward. Like I said, you can see things speeding up a little bit here. Just a lot of recon flights, not a ton else. We can see some Japanese Nell bombers are attacking some, uh, what do you call it, uh, HDMLs, uh, which are like uh, torpedo boat mine layers or something like that, or harbor defense mine layers. Uh, apparently the ships are dead in the water, so I'm guessing they're out of gas or something. And uh, the Japanese are bombing them, but doesn't look like they actually got any hits on them. They're not very valuable ships. They're basically speedboats out there. Um, all right, we'll fast forward a little bit again. More submarine actions here occurring. This, These are off Kwajalein, so we've flooded the area near the Marshall Islands with our own submarines, presuming that the Japanese logistical train is going to have to move through this region as well. More Japanese uh, torpedoes are hitting our ships. These ships are actually unloading cargo at uh, Pago Pago, which is an important base for us in the Samoan Island group. So that loss of that ship is going to hurt. It did have a destroyer escort, interestingly enough. And we did claim three hits. I don't know how real that was. But uh, looks like we just lost the Ruth Alexander. We do have one other cargo ship currently at Pago Pago unloading. Uh, there were no troops there, though. That was just cargo, so that's okay, I guess. And then we've got some uh, destroyers uh, or destroyer minesweepers uh, that are depth charging a Japanese mini submarine, an SSK HA-24. That's one of their midget submarines. And um, we've got uh, destroyers hitting that. One direct hit from a depth charge by the looks of it with heavy damage. That thing will probably sink. You don't generally see a lot in the way of... Uh, durability from midget submarines. Meanwhile, the Japanese are also landing on Shortland, so they really are going for the, uh, the Sam uh, Samal, oh my goodness, not Samal, the, gosh, I'm having some, I'm on the struggle bus tonight, guys, I'm having some trouble uh, pronouncing words. They're landing in the Solomon Islands. Uh, Japanese deliberate attack here south of uh, Keifang. Um, huge odds there. Our lone unit there was destroyed. You can recall in China we've ordered the withdrawal from one of our bases there to fall back because it looks like the Japanese are going to try and flank us. Meanwhile, more combat at Ucho. Mainly just bombardment attacks, so the Japanese didn't launch a deliberate there. Japanese are attacking Georgetown here. So I knew they had troops in Georgetown, and I knew that we wouldn't have enough to with basically withstand any attack. So Georgetown did fall uh, this turn. So the Japanese drive south in the Malay Peninsula has begun, uh, although it's, you know, not a lot to write home about. And that's going to basically do it for this turn. Uh, so we'll jump back in once we can go ahead and issue our orders here in just a moment. But I'm going to cut away here for a second. And when we join you back, we'll be in our allied turn. All right, guys, not a lot going on this turn, to be honest, in terms of activities. We're kind of in a wait and see mode. Uh, I have done a couple of big things that I do want to call out first. We can see he landed here uh, on the shor on Shortlands and he landed here on Tulagi. Both with light forces, so the only two bases in the Solomons, they also are the only two, and, and I don't mean the only, they're the only non-dot bases. So there's dot bases around here, but they're the only two fully fledged formed bases, although both are pretty bare bones with level one ports and no airfields, so he's going to have to take some time to build them up. Uh, but he's landed at both Tulagi and Shortland, and... Uh, if I had to have a hunch, he's building a shield here to guard his flank because we saw another large unit here, and this is the big one, near Duff Islands here. Uh, the Japanese carrier battle fleet, at least in part, has been spotted by recon elements. They're claiming they see three fleet carriers and a tender, a seaplane tender, which very likely could be a fourth carrier. 
To me, what that says is the vast majority of the Japanese carrier fleet is here in the South uh, Pacific here, uh, well south of Ocean and Tar Tarawa. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch that carrier raid that I've been talking about. I won't have the Yorktown because the Yorktown just came in to San Diego last turn. She left San Diego and she's on her way out of San Diego with the Phoenix uh, and the uh, Bagley uh, of the um, different uh, warships that are escorting her toward Pearl. So uh, Yorktown's going to be too far away to participate in anything. But what we're going to do is we're going to form three task forces, and the reason we're doing that is because Allied uh, carrier task forces with more than 100 aircraft at this stage in the war actually get a stacking penalty, so because the American carriers operated individually at this time. So what we're going to do is we're going to form up a task for three task forces around the Saratoga, uh, the Enterprise, and the Lexington. Uh, the Enterprise is going to kind of be the flagship of this uh, a group of squadrons or a group of uh, fleets. Uh, it's going to be led by William Halsey. Uh, the other carrier groups, the Lexington group, will be under Sherman Frederick, who is a very capable rear admiral. And then the uh, Saratoga will be under Raymond Spruance, also a very capable rear admiral of World War II fame. Uh, he would eventually rise to be on par with Admiral Halsey in terms of his responsibilities. So Vice Admiral Halsey is going to lead uh, these three carriers west. They're going to pass just south of Johnston Island, and then they're going to move just a little bit east of Kwajalein and see if they can bomb the hell out of Kwajalein uh, and maybe do some damage, maybe sink some ships. We'll see. That's the tentative objective. Based on how things unfold in the South Pacific, as more information becomes available about the Japanese carriers, we may divert our carriers north to Wake Island. But for the time being, we are going to move them toward Johnston Island. The reason for that is if we moved them north toward Wake or, or Midway, they'd much more quickly be discovered by the Japanese, and they'd be a little bit more isolated. There's actually a little bit of a corridor they can pass down here in relative safety uh, in the Johnston Island area. So that's going to be my plan, is to advance west. Uh, it's going to take a couple of weeks, or a couple of days, not a couple of weeks. So day one, we'll get to about here. Uh, that's what, one, two, three, four, five hexes. I don't know. Does it? Do I do 10 hexes a day or do I do 5? If I do 10 a day, I'll be there in like 3 days. If I do 5, it'll be closer to a week. But we'll see because the Japanese are way far south as well. Uh, I imagine we'll learn a little bit more about their carrier forces inside of 1 to 2 days. And then we'll have to make some decisions about if we want to get in there. And once we do get close to Kwajalein, we'll probably sprint in, bomb, and then sprint out before you can respond. And uh, the objective will not only to be causing a little bit of havoc for the Japanese, the real objective is to derail some of their plans. So as they're moving south, as their carriers are heading uh, toward Espiritu Santos or uh, Nomaya, the goal will be to maybe, just maybe, pull some of his forces north to try and deal with our carriers. And maybe, you know, they'll have the bright, shiny object of, of an objective to try and deal with. Uh, to that point, we're also starting to pull some of our, our ships away. So I have the Indian Brigade is being ordered to unload at Comac, Comac, mainly because of the proximity of the Japanese carriers. I want to drop these guys in one or two turns and get them out of there before the Japanese attack. Same thing, orders are being issued to the, all the troops at Nomaya to get off the ships as quick as they can, and then uh, the ships that are already empty will be sprinting back to Australia. Same story at both Nadi and Suva. And the Queen Elizabeth will probably stay at Nadi one more turn, and then even though it doesn't look like the first Australian brigade will be completely offloaded due to port issues, uh, we're going to pull it out as well as soon as um, we can. And so we're going to start vacating these ships out of these areas to avoid giving the Japanese a target-rich environment if the carrier battle groups do move that far south. Uh, meanwhile, uh, logistics, we continue to see uh, fuel oil pour into Perth. It's up to almost 100,000 fuel at the moment. Uh, we've got another 17,000 about to unload. Uh, and then we're starting to see some of our tankers filter back. So actually, we've got another 6,600 fuel coming in from Balkapin here. We've got five tankers, four tankers, five tankers, four. I can't do math. I can't count. That's four. Uh, that are heading back north to get more fuel from the Dutch East Indies. Uh, we've got another 7,000 uh, fuel coming in here. Uh, about, uh, well, these guys are all going to uh, the west there. They're going to um, off-map toward uh, South Africa. 
and then we've also loaded up additional fuel on some some new tankers here. We've got 9,700 on these fleet oilers and tankers that were just loaded up at Oosthaven, uh, and we've got uh, some 30,000 on some tankers which just loaded up at Balkapen. So we're really trying to continue sucking the Dutch East Indies dry of fuel oil uh, to really take advantage of the Japanese focus elsewhere. Meanwhile, uh, at Mersing, uh, the, what is it, uh, Fifth Field uh, Regiment of Artillery has arrived, and uh, we're struggling to get adequate supplies on all these units, so I'm really kind of holding off from attacking much in the way of anything. But we do have around 360 attack value. That should rise rapidly in the next few turns. We have a huge force of uh, three brigades and five, six, bata seven battalions of infantry all on their way to Mersing with the objective of absolutely crushing once and for all the entire Japanese force here. Uh, it does look like they've strengthened up to about 5,100 uh, men, uh, so we'll have to see if that attack can go through successfully. But I'm hopeful uh, that my, my objective is to, to have some success there. If it fails, we'll just withdraw our troops and we'll move them back to Singapore. Meanwhile, Georgetown has fallen. The Japanese have troops that are moving south, presumably at both Georgetown and the adjoining base. And we have a small blocking force here at Taiping, uh, which will uh, hopefully delay them a day or two uh, before they kind of are fighting their way south along the peninsula. That's the situation in Malaya. Uh, our Air Force in Singapore is going to take, I think, another day off. We'll see. My plan is to have them take the day off. But you can see our fighter strength at Singapore is all, all the way back up to 77 fighters. 21 of those are members of the Flying Tigers. So we've got 21 Flying Tigers, and we've got 11, 15, 19, 22, uh, sorry, uh, 20, and we've got 19 P-40s and we've got 21 Flying Tigers, so that's about 40 modern fighter aircraft, 37 Buffaloes. We're going to take one more day off and get more of these aircraft uh, replenished and back into action. Maybe we'll have around 85 aircraft ready uh, to uh, try and engage with the Japanese in the next couple of turns. Um, nobody else, I think, is going to do anything on the Malay Peninsula. Not a lot to report in uh, China, so we had some movements and some troops are moving around, uh, and uh, the Japanese obviously uh, fought a battle here and destroyed a unit here. They brought 115,000 troops uh, south of Changchow. So as you recall, we're pulling these troops out of Changchow. We're abandoning a very uh, sort of lucrative and large uh, base here. One, we can't draw enough supply to keep the damn thing in good in good shape. And two, it's just it's easily flankable. They're obviously going to move toward here. They're going to avoid attacking across the river, and then they're going to move up from the south, or they're going to go around and flank and hit Luoyang and uh, cut us off that way too. So for the time being anyway, we're going to go ahead and have those troops pulled back and uh, fight more of a delaying action. Meanwhile, we retook Xinyang. Uh, there wasn't really much in the way of supplies or anything here, but we did retake it with this uh, core that was moving um, with the objective of moving back to Nan Nanyang. And then we also have two Chinese corps that are pulling back into Yichang, so we're trying to get our, our forces back rested and refitted in that area. Uh, and we've got a reasonable, actually a reasonable amount of supply uh, in this space as well. Um, this guy is a headquarters unit. It should be in combat mode. Uh, everybody else move? No. I want you to rest. And I want you to rest. I really want everybody to rest. Spends less supply and gets their uh, cohesion and all that up. Um, so that's the situation in China. Not a lot to report there. The situation in Wuchao wasn't great. If they attack, they likely may take the base, but I can't really counterattack because they're too strong there. Um... The situation on the Philippine Islands, uh, Malaya or Manila has fallen. We're falling back on Clark Field. The Japanese have troops near Lin Yang, uh, so presumably they'll be at Clark Field in the next few days. Uh, that's mainly about buying time for Bataan to build itself up in strength. Uh, its airfield is up to 8 79%. Its level 4 fort is up to 35%. I'm hoping I can get to level 4 before they actually get to the base. Uh, that'll go a long way toward giving us some huge defensive perks. The other thing is we have 56,000 supply at Bataan, and we've crammed even more supply in. We've got another, well, actually, we've already unloaded something like 6,000 or, sorry, 5,000 more supply this turn in Bataan, and we've got another 5,000 still coming off the ships, which is pretty crazy that he hasn't actually interdicted or stopped us from continuing to resupply uh, Bataan. The only reason we probably don't have 100,000 supply in the base right now is the uh, spoilage penalty because we've got more 
supply than you can effect effectively support at a base of the size. That's why I'm building the level two airfield is because once it gets to level two, then the spoilage penalties go away and the supplies that we have there will last even longer. Uh, meanwhile, a new Philippine division was raised at Kaigan. Uh, so that brings our defensive strength here up to 42, or sorry, 426. And I think we're going to bring a fast transport into Kaigan to bring its supplies up as well. It actually is a pretty strong defensive uh, spot at level 2. And I'm also going to bring in some supplies to Cebu. I'm more worried this will get interdicted just where we've seen Japanese aircraft, or sorry, ships. But um, it's already a level 2 fort up to 50 uh, toward level 3. It's a small little island, it's hard to get to, and it's got over 100 uh, defensive bonuses as well as some American troops there in the base force. So I want to try and reinforce that and see if we can hold there as well. Uh, none of these are intended to be long-term holding actions, we know we can't do that. It's more about sort of short-term delaying actions. Um, that's the majority of this stuff. Prince of Wales is still over here. She's uh, taking a bit more damage, she's up to 59 floats, so we're slowing them down to mission speed. Uh, it's going to take 1234 about 20 days to get it off the map at these speeds so we're going to have may, we may speed it up again later but we'll see meanwhile the uh, repulse is about 9 days away at its current pace from cape down where it'll start to repair as well um, I don't know why, but for some reason, the uh, troop transports that we had going toward Pegu actually pulled out of Pegu and started moving back toward uh, Tijilap. I, again, I don't know why, but there are some British infantry brigades here that we're going to move back into Pegu to strengthen ourselves in Burma. And that's kind of the situation right now. Again, we've got troops that are coming ashore here at Fiji, at Nomaya, at Comac. We've got a bunch of ships around those regions. We've got a whole bunch of supplies that are on the way. We've got a marine battalion on the way to Pago Pago. We've got a bunch of fuel coming in. We're also uh, diverting one, just a lone tanker here, of 14,000 uh, fuel, uh, which is going to be supporting these fleet operations that are moving west. That 14,000 fuel should be more than enough given the range of where these particular bases are in the Marshall Islands, so it's going to be providing fuel and tanker support uh, as necessary to those vessels to keep them operating. Continuing anti-submarine operations around Pearl Harbor, the battleships are pulling out toward, uh, uh, at least some of the battleships are pulling out back toward the east coast for better and more effective repairs, uh, and the Yorktown is over here, so I, may have, I may have already shown this, but the Yorktown, the Phoenix, and the Bagley are on their way to uh, Pearl Harbor. So that's the situation right now. That's what occurred. We'll take a real quick look at our uh, intelligence report. Japanese, zero air to air. We lost zero air to air. Zero destroyed on the field on both sides. Three Japanese destroyed by flak. Two ops losses on their side. Three on our side. So pretty light day. The lightest air day in quite a while. Um, nobody lost in any meaningful aircraft. We did lose one Catalina, but that's it. Um... Meanwhile, that means we also lost no pilots killed, so we still have our three aces. We lost one wounded in action, nobody killed. Um, ships sunk last turn. We claimed the midget sub that we saw there. Uh, we also lost the Dutch uh, transport, or sorry, cargo ship, the Marapaza, and we lost the American cargo ship Ruth Alexander to Japanese uh, submarines. Um, in terms of ship availability, uh, we've got uh, the Yorktown just arrived. So if we're looking at, let's take a look here. If we're looking at carrier availability, uh, we won't get any carriers in for another about two and a half weeks. And then the Japanese or the British carrier, Indomitable, Indomitable will arrive off map at Aden. Uh, meanwhile, in about two and a half months, we'll get the Hornet. Uh, and about the same time, we'll get a second uh, British carrier in the Formidable. Those will be our final carriers until, well, about four months, so about 120 days away, uh, actually further, well, no, it's about 120 days away, when the next uh, British carrier, the Illustrious, will arrive, uh, which would then be followed up in June by the Wasp. But the Hornet's the last American carrier we're going to get for about six months, and that arrives in about two and a half months. So uh, that's something to look for. It'll arrive in Eastern America in 70 days. Um... In terms of escort carriers, nothing for a while, nothing till May. In terms of battleships, 
We've get we get the royal sovereign at Aden with the uh, indomitable in about 15 days. We get the New Mexico, Mississippi, and Idaho all in about a month at San Francisco, uh, and then the British get three battleships at Cape Town in a little below about a month and a half, uh, and then nothing till the middle of the year when the North Carolina arrives. Heavy cruisers or light cruisers. We've got the light cruiser Emerald, which will arrive in Mobasa, which I think is in Madagascar. Uh, in nine days, the Dorcha or the Dor Dorshire Dorchestire uh, will arrive at Cape Town in about two weeks. Uh, the Sumatra will arrive in Surabaya in about a month. Uh, the Nashville at Balboa in about a month and a half. And the first anti-aircraft cruiser, the Van Hem- Hernix, will arrive in about uh, oh, just shy of two months. Followed by the Vincentes and the Newcastle and the Devonshire, uh, and then the list goes on. Um, anything else worth calling out? I think we've got some subs that'll be arriving soon. Uh, the first British sub, the Trusty, will arrive at Aden tomorrow. And I think that's about it for that. Uh, ground units destroyed. You know, we've lost some. The most impactful was the FM uh, SV, which was the uh, force at uh, Hong Kong. It was a very good quality uh, unit. Um, but other than that, meh. Nothing, I don't think, lost this last turn. Oh, we did lose the uh, Penang Fort. We can't recall them, though. That's a fixed unit. Um, but that's all the ground units we lost that turn. Uh, ground reinforcements. Take a look. It looks like we're going to be getting the 2nd Royal Tank Regiment uh, at Aden, uh, which you can deploy to Burma. It'll be consisting of some 42 Stuart Light Tanks and some infantry. That's actually a pretty good tank regiment. The 1st Marine Raider Regiment will arrive in about a week in the eastern U.S., uh, Pacific Fleet Headquarters, so we can move it around as we see fit. And then we've got a troop convoy, or a convoy, sorry, of some kind, a merchant convoy, arriving at uh, Cape Town in about a week as well. A new Chinese Corps showing up in 10 days in Chongqing. Uh, More Australian troops, more headquarters... Yeah, we don't really see any really big units. This first, the 16th Australian Brigade, that's going to be a good one. AIF Infantry Sections. Australian Infantry, so they're not militia. So actually, it's going to be a really good brigade when that does arrive in uh, two weeks. Um, for the 17th Brigade is also that. So it looks like some of the Australian units that we're going to be seeing in the next couple of weeks are actually very high-quality units. Um, 19th, are they the same? Jesus. I'm finally going to be getting some non-militia troops. That's exciting. And a lot of them are coming in at Aden, so it looks like they're probably being pulled out of the European theater. Uh, Eastern U.S., we're going to get two infantry regiments in about 22 days. So toward the middle of January, we should see some quality infantry units that are going to be showing up that we can deploy to wherever. A tank battalion, two infantry battalions. Um, and that's kind of the, the bulk of it, at least till we get a month out or so. We're going to start to see some Indian units arrive as well. So that's the uh, ground units. That's the air units. Um, actually, I didn't look at the air, air units, did I? Uh, group reinforcement. We're going to get 16 Kitty Hawks in Canada. That'll be nice. Those are P-40s. And then in uh, four days, we're going to be getting uh, multiple groups of P-40s, but they're all attached to Eastern uh, USA headquarters, I'm assuming. Second US fighter squadron. Maybe we can actually use them. I'm not sure. So we're going to be getting about 80 uh, Warhawks that are going to be arriving here in four days. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it looks like some P-40s are going to be showing up in Brisbane as well. So we're going to be getting three squadrons of P-40s in Australia for free without having to transport them. So that'll be nice. Um... And, uh, yeah, we're going to be getting some troop transports in India in about two weeks, some Skytrains, some Blenheims and Adem, some Hurricanes. We're going to get three Hurricane squadrons here at, at Aden here in the next two weeks as well. So we're really going to see ourselves in the next two weeks, our air units are really going to start reinforcing Australia and also the Indian theater. So that's exciting to see. And I think that's about it, guys. I don't have a lot else to show you. Um... I know you guys had been asking to see some of the reinforcement pools. I think we covered that. Um, so, yeah, I think this is more of just me telling you some things, and we'll see how it all plays out. But that's uh, 
uh, January 30th, uh, or actually it's not January 31st. So when next we meet, we will be looking at the combat results of January 31st, and we will be moving forward into Jan- into 19, uh, or sorry, I'm saying January, it's December. Uh, but when I see you next, we'll be moving into uh, 1942, indeed in January. So uh, that's exciting. We're going to be through the first and, and often most consequential month in the game. And um, so far, I'm feeling okay about myself. I mean, there's definitely challenges. Uh, if the Japanese make some big strides in the South Pacific, that'll be some some big things to overcome. But I, honestly, I don't think anything he can do there, shy of like a sprint south to take New Zealand. As long as he doesn't take New Zealand or land in Australia, both of which I think he would fail at at this stage, he has no way to support either from a logistical and certainly not Australia from a manpower perspective. But as long as we, we don't lose either of those two islands in the next, I don't know, few months, I'm feeling okay about it. Like, even if the Fiji line falls, it doesn't cut Australia off. He probably thinks it does, but it doesn't, because I can just divert way south and go through New Zealand. And I've also got the Cape Town uh, troop transport line. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, but overall, feeling okay about things. Uh, we've uh, got another glimpse of the carriers, and we're going to be making our first serious naval offensive raid uh, in the next week or so, week or two, uh, probably week, week to one, week and a half, uh, as we kind of move toward Kwajalein or Wake. The question really is where we think we can do the most damage, but also not take undue risk. Kwajalein, I think, is definitely where we would do the most damage. But the problem with that is that, you know, while you do the most damage, you also uh, have the most risk. So that's just something that we need to be aware of. A lot of subs still getting into position. Uh, we'll deal with those more next turn. But I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this up here. Let's go ahead and save the game. And uh, I don't know why he called his turn for the Kaiser. I'm not really sure. But uh, anyway, guys, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I'll pass the turn over to XTRG probably today. And uh, you may see his streams uh, today or tomorrow or whenever. But hope you guys are enjoying the series. Uh, welcome back to this. And let me know what you guys want to see next time. Until then, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching. And I'm out.